Oh. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Encompass Live. This is uh, the Library Commission's weekly show at 10 a.m. Central Time, or roughly 10 a.m. I'm Sally Snyder, and I'm your host this morning. And I'm really excited because we'll be hosting Natalie Bazan, director of the River Valley Li District Library in Port Byron, Illinois. And she's going to talk about what is your library worth? And this looks like a great topic. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Natalie. And um, when you're ready, we'll get started with your slides and I'll take mine down. Okay, go right ahead, anytime. Okay, let's see. Where are you? Oh, here you are. Okay, now I just have my screensaver up there. Um, you have to go back into the GoToWebinar and click Change Presenter. Oh, or... yeah, okay. Although I love the diver. I'm so jealous. No. It's so cold here right now. <laughs> Take control. Oh, that's it. Life is fun. <laughs> I'm in there and I'm trying to click on you and say take control. I made you a presenter. There we go. There. There's a little window. Okay. Hello everyone. You should see my screen now I'm guessing. I believe so. All right. So if anybody can chime in in the chat window and let me know if you're seeing a screen that says, what is your, what is a library worth? That We're using the questions happy. window, not the chat window. Sorry. So Questions okay. window. Yep. Okay. We're seeing so, your screens. Fantastic. So. All right. So I often get, especially at the library that I'm at now, the River Valley District Library, I get a lot of questions from my board and the community. What does our money go towards? You know, what is the library actually worth? Why should we bother to fund this? What's the point? I got a lot less of these questions in Michigan. So quite honestly, I was kind of surprised to get these questions when um, I was working at a library. How does everyone not know what a library is worth? How do they not understand what good we do for the community and what comes out of their money? But apparently they don't. Um, I actually have a couple of board members who had run to make sure that the taxes to the library never increased because they didn't think that the library ever needed any more money or anything else. Oh my. Yes. Thankfully, uh, they have gone from, we really shouldn't be funding the library to, yeah, you're right, the library really does need more space in the matter of about six months of me working there. Um, which I am extremely proud of. I realize it's just the start, but it's a good start. That's amazing. It's it was it was definitely something. Um, unfortunately, today is actually my last day at the River Valley District Library. But on the plus side, mm -hmm. I set it up for the next person, so they should have a little bit easier time than I did. So I kind of started coming up with ideas on how do I quantify something that how do I break down what we do into numbers? How do I make this so they can understand it, so they can see what we're actually worth in the dollars and cents? And how do I make sure that they understand and our community understands what we offer? What makes us special and unique? You know, library marketing has been a big topic for a couple of years, and we're not, we're gonna touch on library marketing a little bit, but that's not really where I'm going. I'm more interested in, let's talk about the dollars and cents. So everything that you're gonna see here is based on the River Valley District Library. So let me tell you a little bit about it. We serve a population of 5,176 people. Um, Port Byron, Illinois is a village about, well, the village of Point Byron is about 1,500 people, give or take. 
And then we have surrounding farmland and small towns and communities right in that area. We're not a huge district. In Michigan, I served, um, it was 100 square miles and I had 4,600 people. So it was more rural than this, but we are in a picturesque right on the Mississippi River, a little town um, right across from LeClaire, Iowa, which is where the American pickers are. So it's really cute. It's really fun. They do a bunch of neat things. And the library is right on Main Street. Main Street in Port Byron is, um, on, on our side of the street, we have the library, our parking lot, the road, the railroad, and the Mississippi River. So we have a fantastic view of the river and everything that goes on in it, but our library wasn't really built to take advantage of that. So that was something that we couldn't do a whole lot about. So we did add some outdoor seating and some nice little outdoor areas that people can hang out and watch the river and watch everything that goes on there. But that doesn't really give us a dollar value. So our annual budget is just under half a million. Really with what I have to play for, it's more like four, or what I have to play with, it's more like 480,000. Um, but we pro in 498,000 every year. And some of that goes to um, the state of Illinois has an IMRF plan. So we have a retirement plan for our, our full-time employees and various other things that I can't change. But there are a lot of things that we could change. And we found out just, just taking our rough numbers, our raw data that everybody collects, right? You all know how many of you keep track of how many books you check out and DVDs and reference questions, all of those things that PLA and IMLS always want to know from us. If you could respond, either raise your hand or respond in the chat window, what you keep track of. We took that and we took that data, we put it into the ALA, well, it's the ALA's um, value calculator, the return on investment calculator. and I produced the first annual report for River Valley, and it showed that we had a return on investment of about $1.4 million. And I got a huge amount of flack for that. I thought everybody would be excited. You know, they're getting lots of, lots of return on investment, but they didn't understand how I got that number. They didn't understand where that came from. They wanted to know exactly how many people are using the library, what was going into that, and break it down for them. They wanted a breakdown. I could do a breakdown. That's easy enough. We have so, one responder who says, we keep track of all these reports. I think she's talking about the ones you have listed here. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but. No, you're good. That's great. If you're not keeping track of these things, these are really important statistics that you can use. I mean, not just for yourself to understand, okay, are, how are trends going? Are more books being checked out? Are more DVDs being checked out? Should we invest more in different things? Are people using our databases more or are they using um, the library itself? Are they coming in more? We keep track of a lot of those statistics, and I'll show you more on the next slide. But we took our book, our all of our numbers are from last year, the 1617 fiscal year. And I had been there, oh, one month um, when that fiscal year ended. So a lot of these were, all of these numbers are before that I came. And I took those and I plugged them into the value calculator and let people know, okay, so this, the 41,000 books that people checked out would have cost them over a million dollars if they had purchased them. And you need to know if those are adult books, if those are teen books, if those are kids books, so that you can put them in and get the correct values for them. The DVDs, the, the value calculator, for some fun reason, decides that um, they, and I understand why, but they give you a value based on if you had rented those DVDs. I don't know a whole lot of places you can go to rent DVDs anymore. 
most of those have shut down. So if you are checking out DVDs, you may want to change that number or you may want to explain that number to people better because they're looking at it's a whole lot more than $4 to buy a DVD. Um, reference questions get a value. People attending your programs get a value. People coming in and reading magazines and checking out um, movie. I don't know if you have museum passes. Do any of you rent out museum passes or loan out museum passes? Oh, that's Does a nice idea. I didn't think of that. We um, we partner up with a botanical center, a zoo. We have a um, art museum, and up until this past year, there was a zooseum pass. So we had um, the museum and the children's, or the uh, zoo and the children's museum had gotten together and had a pass that we could get, and we could loan it out to people. We only loan it out for a couple of days. Um, and they have to bring it back, otherwise they face a hefty fine, but it has been really, really helpful for us. And people just love it. You know, it gives them something where they can take their kids and still be learning and still be experiencing new things, and then they come back and their kids are uh, curious and interested and they want to know more about all of the animals that they saw or the plants they saw or the things they experienced. And that increases our circulation, too. And that can work for the zoo or the museum because mm -hmm. the family might decide to get a membership after they've been there and the kids have been all excited. So they, exactly. they have that possibility, too. Now, the downside that we found with our museum, well, our zoo, actually, the museum's okay, but the zoo, the zoo now charges for parking. So this doesn't cover parking. It just covers entrance fees. So... You know, you're, if your families are borrowing something like this, they're not having to pay for entrance fees, so maybe they're more likely to take that money and use it for concessions or, mm -hmm. yes, getting their own membership. So it, it's a really good way to bargain with museums to get them to do things like this. Great idea. Okay. You can see that, you know, the Massachusetts Library Association put this together and ALA has it on their website. I actually have it pulled up if we want to play with it a little bit later if people want to give me some numbers. But the link is right there for you. If you put in your numbers and you keep track of your number, you keep track of what you do, you can put these numbers together and in seconds you have what your library is worth. I've done this. I started doing this on a monthly basis for my board members. It helped. I have several business people on who, um, like I said, they got on the board because they wanted taxes for the library to either go down, stop entirely, or they wanted a really good reason why we wanted money to fund a library. So being able to provide them with those numbers really helped being able to show them that they are getting three dollars back for every dollar they spend at the library is huge i don't know if any of you have board members or community members who are very much tea party members or are watching well any of the many different political parties that are really curious and starting to get back involved in civics and trying to understand what this money is going towards and how it's benefiting the community. But this gives them concrete information. And so, you know, when we save this uh, presentation to be viewed in the future by other people, we also will have these, this, these slides for people to refer to. And then we pull out things like that URL that you saw there so you don't have to write it down. And then you can, we'll put that in another um, box for people to click on to go see how that calculator works. So don't worry about writing down all those words in the URL. And most importantly, it's free. I don't know about Yay. you, but yes, I, I might have a half a million dollar budget, but in Michigan, when I was director of libraries there, I had $100,000. And I was using this to its fullest extent because I didn't have money to buy any of the many softwares out there that will do things like this for you and keep track of things like this for you. 
So let's go to the value calculator. Is there anybody out there who would be willing to throw out some numbers so we can give you an idea using your numbers of what you would be worth? If you have a microphone, just uh, type in there. I have a microphone and I'll, I'll make your microphone active or type it into the question slot. They can be rough numbers. They don't have to be your exact numbers, but I'd love to be able to show you what you guys are worth. And just in case your board members or anybody else are interested in where, you know, how much money is being is being allocated for one adult book, instead of just putting one in each category to see what comes up, you can oh. click on value of your use. And it will come up and it will tell you and it will tell you why. So oh. you'll know that the average price for adult books is 17, kids books is around 17, young adult. Audible is doing a download for 9.95, and these are the amounts that they tend to put on there. Oh, that's great to be able to see that and know. Then you can tell your board, well, here's how they determined that, because I would ask that question. Right, and that is a big question that comes up a lot. You know, they're curious, okay, so the museum passes that I talked about, I know to get into, um, say, the Brookfield Zoo in Illinois, I know that I can get passes at my local library. It's going to cost a whole heck of a lot more than $20 to get in there, but that's what they're estimating it and averaging it out to be because the museum, the Niobe Zoo over by Port Byron, where we have our zoo pass, is a lot less than $20 to get in. Well, it's actually probably just a little bit less. Um, and I think our, yeah, our uh, museum pass actually covers four, but it gives you a good basis and you can tell people, okay, so it might say that it'd be about $15 to go to one of your programs. What if you're doing how to make cheese or how to make soap at your library? I've done both of these. Soap making, if I went to a class elsewhere, could cost upwards of $100 per person. So, yeah, that should average out with something like we're doing a talk on homeschooling at the library. That didn't cost the library anything and may have just been community members getting together to discuss things. That would average out nicely. So, no, not every program is going to be that much. But we're not getting any numbers yet or any volunteers yet. All right. Well, if you guys want to try this on your own, feel free. It is fun. I really enjoy doing it. I think it, uh, my circulation staff actually really like that program because, and this next one I'm going to show you, because it gives them a reason why they're keeping track of some of the statistics that they do. So the PLA every year sends out an email asking for people to put in their statistics so that they can keep track of things so that they know how things are going. And in return for doing that, they send you a link to a trifold brochure that you can use. I didn't do any edits whatsoever. This is exactly what they sent me. And it shows you, this is the, well, this would be the front cover and this is the back cover, and then this is the inside flap, and it gives you just the general information. So here's my population, that's how many books I have, that's how many of my 5,100 people are actually registered with the library card, and then it adds everything up. So physical circulation, that's everything that I physically let people check out. We let them check out about 78,000 items last year. Um, and it continues on down. Obviously, we need to work on our electronic circulation because that's kind of low. But I didn't put database numbers in there. That was only books that were checked out. Um, in library use is something that my circulation staff keeps track of. So if you happen to come in the library, I don't know how many of you keep track of this, but do you notice, do you note down how many people are reading newspapers at your library. If you don't check them out, it's really nice to know the statistics on that. Um, reference questions, 
that is these numbers are actually all based on this year so far and I estimated out what it's going to be for the rest of the year. Program attendance or website visits, this gives them a little bit of everything that I could think of and that the PLA asked for. On the inside is more detailed information. And this is where you may want to make some edits to help people understand what's going on. So number, the percentage of full-time employees with a librarian title. FTEs doesn't mean a whole lot to most people. So I realize that I need to change that if I'm going to be handing that out to people because otherwise it's not gonna make sense. Your circulation per staff member. That's a huge number. Letting people know that, yeah, although you may have walked in and seen our staff chatting or didn't seem to be working on anything or playing on the computer, they really weren't. Maybe they had a little bit of downtime, but in reality, our staff are working really hard. And this is one of the ways that you can prove that. So circulation per capita is a great number to watch. If your non-library using people are curious about why why are they paying for this thing that they're not using? Which comes up so much. Who has heard that question? If you could raise your hand, please do. I'm not using the library, so why should I pay for it? That's just like I'm not using school systems, so why should I pay for it? That's just what I was uh, thinking of, yes. People yeah. say that too. Isn't that frustrating? So you can tell them this is per capita. This is not per registered library user. This is per your entire population. There are 16 items going to every single person in my district if every single person had a library card. Every time one person walks in, they're likely to walk out with two items or having done two, having taken out two things. Circulation per borrower, sure. You know what, you should all be registered library users, but the ones of you that are not, this is what those, the rest of them are using. This is what they're saving. Multiply that out, that's what they're saving every year and you're not. So this is a good way to be able to tell people who are not using these features that if you were using these features, you could be saving this much every year. Talk about New Year's resolutions, there you go. There is something yeah. that, you know, there's an easy one. Forget this whole weight loss thing and everything. <laughs> I can save money by getting a library card that's free. Yeah, I'm all over that. So you get the idea. We have uh, collection turnover is always a little bit iffy. We have a very high collection turnover, unfortunately, because we have no space. It is really, really tight in there. Um, forget the whole, your shelves are only supposed to be filled to about 70% because if everything came back, you'd be overwhelmed. Yeah, ours are about 90% all the time because otherwise we would just be weeding, well, every, I think our, our weeding is up to every two years now. Um, anything that's been, that we've had for more than two years that hasn't checked out is gone because we just honestly can't keep it. Wow. It's sad. Um, so you can see, you know, holdings per capita. We have nine and a half books per, or nine and a half materials per person in our district. So if they're coming in saying, well, I don't think you'd have enough books for all of you or for all of us, you don't have what I'm looking for. So that's fine. We might not have what you're looking for, but did you know that although we only have nine books per person, we're also part of a co-op. How many of you are part of co-ops or do interlibrary loan or work with other libraries cooperatively like that? I'm not sure what Nebraska has, but Illinois has a couple of co-ops that reach across the state and do a fantastic job of providing access to books that I could be ordering. I'm on the Mississippi River. I could be ordering books from the University of Chicago and have them shipped over. Not a problem, which is a huge thing for us. Um, I was, 
I am taking classes at our local Catholic church. And they came in and they said, yeah, we have this great book. It's a textbook, but it's like $160 if you want to buy it. But if any of you want to look at it, you know, I have one here before you want to buy it. And I said, well, why don't you just interlibrary loan it at the library? Oh, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, you could get this at the library and see if you like it before you want to buy it. Like, yes, yes, you could. Seriously, people, I'm a librarian. How do you not know this? <laughs> well, it you don't surprise. know this. I, I know. You don't know this because obviously we haven't done a good enough job of telling people this. And that's kind of humbling. And that's kind of worrying because if people, if we don't go out there and tell them, they don't know it's there. That's true. So we started printing these out and we print them out for, we have a pile of them at our circulation desk. Our, like I said, our circulation staff is really happy to know that the numbers that they're putting together matter. You know, they're not just going on a spreadsheet that no one is ever going to see in their life. These numbers actually matter. And they can point this out to our patrons who come in and say, hey, look, did you want... Did you ever wonder how many things are checked out, how this actually goes? It has actually led to, every time I print these out, they're gone in like an instant. It's, it's kind of humbling. Um, and it has led to a lot of people coming in and saying, hey, I know you have some programs coming up. Do you need volunteers for that? Do you need donations for that? I've got some stuff I think you could use for that or... I got a little extra money for Christmas, and I would like it to go towards this. That's great. It has been fantastic. So we all know about books and shushing, and for some reason, my library board still thought we were all books and shushing. That was honestly what they thought the library was. For the last, um, I've been there almost eight months, actually. Um, for the last eight months, I have been working on convincing them that we are a very active library. We have a focus on learning and connecting people, making sure they can connect with each other and making sure they connect with different groups in the community and just bringing everybody together. We've been providing meeting spaces for community groups. We were talking about um, our second story is about half the size of our main story. And we've been talking about expanding that out so it's the same size. And the board keeps asking me, well, well, they don't keep asking me. They don't ask me anymore, um, but they <laughs> did. They asked, uh, why do we need that extra space? What are you going to use it for? And I said, we need meeting rooms. We have our upper story is one big meeting room and that's it. We don't have study rooms. We don't have quiet nooks. We don't have anything else. That is the only space we have. And they said, no, 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 you don't need that. That's silly. That's pointless. Until I pointed out to them on a board meeting night, we had the junior Rams, which is the um, junior high uh, football group coming in to do a talk with parents. And we had to put them at a table downstairs which is in a little tiny nook in our front window. Um, so some people got the nice cushy window seat and some people got the hardwood chairs all pulled up around a tiny little eight foot <laughs> table with all these football player parents. Uh, and we also had a group that had come in, a writer's group that wanted to chat and do some things with their members. This was a special board meeting. So this was a night that they normally would have had the upstairs and we had to put them in the other bay window. So we had three things going on at the same time. And they, I made them come downstairs and said, hey, walk around. And they were shocked. They were very surprised. Um, it's also been a push to teach the library board that creative programming, it does allow our patrons to learn new skills. You know, I don't know about you guys, but Port Byron does not have a community center. If people want to go and take some classes, they're going to have to hike it over to 
um, one of the colleges, one of the universities, if they're lucky, maybe some of the high schools do some evening classes, but nobody in my area does. Um, I don't know about your communities, but we just, we're too small. We don't do that. We don't have enough people to do that. We don't have the money laying around to be able to do something like that. So the library is the community center. We are providing skills for people, places for people to learn new skills. And that doesn't just translate then to them coming into programs, but I've had to make sure my library board understands that also translates into circulation. That, that brings us in the hard numbers. They come to learn a program, say they came to learn the soap making program. Okay, they learned soap making. Now all of a sudden they want to check out a whole bunch of soap making books. And oh yeah, can you teach me a class on learning how to do Etsy? Because I've been making soap at home and now I kind of want to sell it. And do you have any classes on, oh, I don't know, accounting? <laughs> oh, good point. <laughs> yeah. So we, all right, I, I'm going to admit I am not an accounting major. So <laughs> we, uh, we subscribe to Gale courses and they have accounting classes and small business classes. So I can teach them a class on how to use our databases, which again, it helps people learn what we have to offer. It ups our numbers, it gets people more involved, and then they start talking. So we are in the process right now of doing some community betterment projects, but this is something that I had done back in Michigan before I moved to Illinois, which was only a year ago. Um, and brings a whole lot of attention to the library. It's not necessarily a marketing thing. It is, but it, in some ways it is because it's bringing attention to us. Uh, how many of you have gardening programs or um, something spring type related where you do, uh, we used to do flowers in February. Yeah, I'm definitely not doing that today. <laughs> it's snowing as I look out the window. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was one of those partner up with a greenhouse, let the little kids plant some flowers and take them home to mom, that type of thing. Or, you know, in the spring we did, let's learn how to make, oh, let's learn about gardening or let's learn about small gardening or let's do our seed library or... Um, various other things like that. Do any of you do something like that or I make know, garden stuff? I know Nebraska has a number of libraries that have gardens outside the building that <clears throat> they either have a group that works with them or the kids come and help plant. Different libraries have different programs, but there are a number of libraries in the state that, that have a garden where the community is involved in working on it and, and being involved with that garden. That is great. So, we did we did um, pots around our library back in Michigan because we had a very small area and the library here we've plotted off an area next to the library which well we're not going to plant for a couple months but that's um, going to be our our community garden area where we can do classes but in addition to that we teamed up with a local greenhouse a wholesaler actually a perennial wholesaler and. Every year, there's a lot of waste. We know this, right? Um, we hear about it all the time in conjunction with grocery stores and with, um, well, pretty much every industry. But grocery stores have been on the hit list for a little while because food won't be absolutely perfectly pretty or anything like that. It gets tossed. Well, plants are the same way. If they're not pretty and gorgeous and flowering, they're in the clearance section, right? Well, right. if you're a wholesaler, you need to produce these plants for the people who are going to grow them up to make them pretty and blah, blah, blah. If those people either cancel an order or maybe the flat of, I don't know, lavender came up and half of it died and the other half is eh, it's okay it's a little stunted you know something like that or the easter lilies went to flower way too early or um hydrangeas are looking pretty spindly they can't sell them 
they can't give them out to their retailers and they're not, they're just not going to make money out of them. So generally they toss them. So we partnered up with a wholesaler in our area and we ended up with something around $10,000 worth of perennials. And yeah, they weren't absolutely a perfect condition, but they were free. So nice. Yeah, no kidding. It was really exciting. So we put all over that the library wants to beautify the community. This is our summer project and we want you to help. Come to the library on this particular sun Saturday and it was in I think it was late May, early June. Come to the library and pick up some perennials and all we ask is that if anybody asks, you tell them where you got it and you send us a picture when you plant them. We got Great pictures. idea. We got people who were asking if we could make signs that they could put up in their nice little gardens that they just planted, let's say from the library. Which, of course, we didn't think about at the time. And then we were beating our head against the wall. Why? Oh, why did we not have signs for people? But that's one of those next time things, right? Indeed. <laughs> And that brought us a lot more people who were excited, who were coming in, who might not usually come in, but it's a community betterment project and they all want to get behind it, especially if it's free. The next one that I hear all the time, the library is inconvenient. Um, how many people, I'm sure everyone has heard this at one point in time or another, I can't make it there. Your hours are inconvenient. I just don't feel like going back out after I get home. The having to return the book just takes so much time and I always forget and it's always late and, 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 right? So I don't have the money to open up a branch. I know that most small libraries, there is no way in the world you're going to afford being able to open up a branch. Um, just maintaining a physical location is not realistic. Maintaining a digital location is. And I know, especially in smaller rural areas, that a lot of our people don't have access to the internet. But a lot of them do. And this might be more geared towards the ones who do than the ones who don't. Um, the ones who don't can always use it when they come into the library or when they go to someplace that has Wi-Fi. But running and creating a digital branch, which for us is our website, um, was really important to us. It gave us the opportunity to start reaching out to people. We put things on there like our databases. Hey, did you know that you can learn how to play guitar on the library's website. You can take a six week class on how to play guitar on the library's website. You can learn mango languages. You're sitting at a restaurant, you can learn some pirate before your food comes. You can learn that accounting class that you always wanted to do. You can check out those eBooks. You can check out the audiobooks. You can get free music downloads. Again, it's an advertising thing that, yeah, we still need to work harder on too because we just started doing this. So we've just started pushing it, but it's out there and it's available. And that gives us a good start. But when we broached it with our library board, um, they got a website that was actually realistically usable and had information on it maybe six months before I got there. So about a year and a half ago, give or take, they got a usable website that actually has tabs and they can actually put information on there. But prior to that, it was the one page, here's our info, click here to get onto um, our shared library catalog. And that was it. So this has been a huge change for the library board. And again, they're looking at it where, prove it to me, prove that the money that we're spending is actually making a difference. So we have been, again, it's, it's keep track of statistics, be able to tell them, hey, this number of people are going to use our Gale courses. 
And that brings us to doing um, classes in the library to show people how to use Gale courses. That's all well and good if you see it on the library website, but if I don't know how to use that, eh, it's cool, but it's, it's just out there and I can't do anything with it. So come in. We'll teach you how to download a book. We'll show you how to use it. That has been really helpful for us. We just replaced our computers and the previous library, the previous time that they replaced computers for patrons, they had purchased four laptops and we had them hooked up. They weren't ones that you could check out and just take around. They were actually hooked up and people could work on those instead of a desktop. And the idea was, you know, eventually maybe we could let people walk around with them or different things, but that had never happened. So we switched out computers and we sold off all the old desktops and the laptops we kept and they're not in the greatest of shape. They've been beat on for a couple of years. Patrons are not necessarily the, uh, the nicest to our computers. I don't know about you, but ours are not. Um, but we threw a sticker on them and let people check them out. They're, we already put the money into it. We already got the money back out of it. This is nothing for us. And if you've got a computer store near you, maybe not a Best Buy, but just a, like a local computer store, you might want to talk to them and see if they get trade-ins or they get used laptops that are still decent, but are not what the people wanted anymore. And then you can do this too, and it's not going to cost you anything. But you can check those things out to patrons and then they can use computers at home or they can use them around the library. And if you do that with mobile hotspots, all of a sudden you just gave your patrons a computer and the internet all at once. And that's a huge add, value add for them. It gives them access to your digital branch so you know that they can use more of the things that you have. And that has helped us a lot. It's still a work in progress. It's still a marketing issue, but we're working on it. We have also been working on expanding our collection. And this is something that I have had fun with ever since I started being a library director. We've done the e-collection. I talked about the website as a branch. We've done binge boxes. Have any of you done this or heard about this? Not so much. Okay. Um, this idea came up a couple of years ago um, from a gentleman who worked at a library in, I want to say North Carolina but I might be crazy. This is a distinct possibility today. Who knows? Um, it's a little plastic box with a handle and it has, you can put five, six DVDs in there. So if you're, say you're homesick or, you know, it's snowing outside and you don't want to go anywhere, you go to the library and you check out, um, let's say my box has Star Wars, and the first six movies, right? Four, five, and six, and then they added in one, two, and three. So now I check them all out. I'm just gonna sit home and watch those, make some popcorn. Hopefully I've got a pizza because takeout's not gonna make it today. And besides that, it won't make it to my house because I'm too far away. Um, I don't have to check out movie four and then realize five and six are checked out by somebody else. So then I got one and three and I'm waiting for everybody else to return their DVD. You can do any topic you like, any grouping you like. Um, we stayed away from doing TV series because if you're checking out six seasons of Big Bang Theory and watching those in the week that we let you check this out, oh. I'm really worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> really worried. But if you're checking out maybe, oh, Jurassic Park, one through, I think they're up to four now. Or if we want to do uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, throw all those together. Or um, maybe I just want to do Hallmark Christmas movies. One of my most popular was always um, Disney princess movies. Ah, uh, yeah. Or my, Marvel my comics. Love that. 
Yes. The Disney princess movies are just crazy. Those go out constantly. And you can do classic Disney princesses, new Disney princesses. You can do Barbie. You can do anything you like. Um, that has been really helpful for us. Makerspace kits. Uh, I certainly don't have the room to put in one of those absolutely gorgeous makerspaces that let people, you know, set out whole sewing tables. I have a dozen people doing this at once. Yeah, no. Um, but I do have room for little kits. And I put them in little plastic, you know, those plastic boxes that are heavy duty enough to where they're not going to break immediately. Um, list all the pieces, everything that you're putting in there that you want back. If you're putting, um, we have a fidget spinner making kit. If you're putting a fidget spinner in there and you want that one back, then you better make sure that it's listed on that list. But we check those out for about a month and they will take a book. They'll have a book in there to tell you how to do whatever you're checking out, plus all the tools to make whatever it is. And maybe we got some raw materials donated. Like um, we have a fly tying kit in Hopkins back in Michigan. And we did a fly tying class. To pick up the tools to do fly tying is about 50 bucks give or take. You can find them cheaper if you get them on sale. But realistically, if you just took a class and you don't really know if you want to try, if you want to do this at home, yeah, I don't know if I want to spend 50 bucks on it. But I can check out the tools. It's got a book on telling me how to use it, how to do things. And somebody had donated some yarn and random fishing hooks and stuff because we get weird stuff donated at the library <laughs> why we had fishing hooks let's not go there um, but we can throw those in there and on the list I'm going to make sure that my circulation staff knows that there's a book that there's tools and that it includes these tools I don't care about the yarn I don't care about the hooks if they come back great if they don't and somebody use them that's also great the Library of Things, I have a great picture here from the American Library magazine. Um, if you check out stuff, you've got a collection of stuff at your library. Maybe you've got Santa suits like Louisiana does, or I don't know, the fondues kind of worry me. The taxidermy animals I think is kind of cool, but a little bit weird too. Um, but anything that you've got that you think that your patrons would like. If you have an art collection that rotates out and you check those out, it's something that's fun. That is something that they would never expect at the library. And it's going to bring you more people. And then they're going to see what else you've got to offer. Games. We've been checking out games everywhere I go. It is really easy to convince my library board to go that direction by telling them, hey, these are multi-generational events that we're encouraging even when they're not at the library so we checked out yeah we check out monopoly okay yes there are a million pieces of monopoly you're probably not going to get all that money back i'm just going to tell you right now <laughs> but on the plus side copying monopoly money totally legal legal is good um, but you know that it's not just kids who are playing that, right? Parents are going to sit down with their kids. Grandparents are going to sit down with their grandkids or the whole family is going to sit down together and somebody's going to be the shoe and somebody's going to lose. It's going to happen, but they're learning lots of stuff. They're playing together as a family. They're getting together and we're encouraging that. And we need to be visible. Um, you know, it's great. We've got all of our stats together. We've got all our numbers put together. We've got all of our things, all of our little trifold brochures that I was talking about. We put our value add info on our website, on our Facebook. You know what you're getting. But if we're not getting that info to our people, it doesn't really make any difference what we do. This brings up a little bit of the marketing. I've gone through a whole bunch of marketing classes and talked to a whole bunch of people and they always say, well, don't bother to do posters. Don't do mailings to your people. That's silly. It's just a waste of money. Nobody looks at it. 
honestly, that depends on your your demographic. It depends on your people. It depends on your area. My area, people love posters. People love to see our posters up in the bar. They like to see our stuff up in the post office. They like to see it up in the bank. And they stop and they read it. And then they ask us about it. We get calls from that. We did our first mailing to everybody in our district that I think it's the first one in maybe 10 years, uh, a couple months ago. Every class, every program that we had on there was full within like two weeks. It was, I, I had stuff on there for February and March and we mailed this out in, in October and they were full. Wow. It was crazy to the point where we started having to add additional programs and let people know, hey, um, yeah, it, maybe you're going to have to come into the library more often and check out what we've got or watch our website or watch our Facebook and we'll let you know if we add additional classes for that program. Um, that has been huge. That I am crediting with increasing our online numbers a huge amount because we did big focus features on what types of databases we have about learning how to play the guitar, about learning how to use how to learn pirate, or hey, you're going on a trip and you want to learn some new language, just a little bit of it. There you go. You want to be able to download audiobooks. Hey, you don't have to go to Audible and pay your ten bucks a piece. You can do it on the library website for free. That was all on our mailings, along with our museum passes, the fact that we check out puppets, all different things like that. But that's my community. I don't know if your community likes mailings or if they're the people who just take them and toss them. They see it as junk mail and they're never going to look at it. Um, Partner with some businesses and groups and organizations. That gets you an immediate uh, audience. You know, they are going to talk to their people and you're not going to have to. They're going to do some of the advertising for you. They know that they're doing this program for you. Hey, they want it to be successful because their name's on it too. And it comes down to be focused on your community. If your community hates posters, nobody ever looks at posters, it's way too expensive to print them out or produce them or you don't want to do, I don't know. Maybe you like to cut out the shapes and put them on the poster board and everything else. I use Canva because it's free and it's pretty and I have no artistic talent. (laughs) (laughs) Either that or publisher, I use that one a lot too. But you, you know, maybe your community hates those things and couldn't care less. Then do something different. Do the coaster or the trivia night at a bar where people see you out there. Do different programs outside of your your space or start talking to people and presenting at schools or make sure that you can get in maybe you can get into the school newsletter once in a while or different things like that where people actually do care about those things even if they're not looking at your mailings because they're just junk mail try different things you're going to get it wrong at some point in time but at least if you're trying you're getting out there And I'm just going to end with, I found this lovely infographic of the 21st Century Library um, that I showed it to my board members and they stared at it and read it and said, oh my gosh, I can't believe the library is doing these things. Why does nobody know about that? I don't know you're doing these things. Granted, my library is not doing all of this. Like I said, we don't have a makerspace. I don't have a place for that, but I do have kids. I may not be helping, well, I might actually be helping people publish stuff a little bit, but I may not be actively publishing content on our website, but we do have a writer's group that meets and they do work on things like that. You know, it's it's trying to make sure that we are a little bit of everything for everyone. Does anyone have any questions? I should have brought water. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing graphic there. Isn't it? I love it. It 
um, while we wait to see if there are any questions, um, I just want to mention that you can go to the Library Commission webpage and click on calendar and look down on Wednesdays to see what different programs are coming. We have quite a few um, lined up now. I think it's through April, if I remember right. Or you can um, search Encompass Live in the search box and go to the page that has more information and about how to register if you want to register for it. If you register, then you'll get an email. And even if you can't attend, you'll still get an email that says, we have this now on our archives. And so you can watch it at your convenience. So that's another reason to, um, to sign up. We have a couple of people who say, thank you so much. Thanks for the webinar. Great information, people are saying. <clears throat> Well, thank you guys all for being here and listening. Thank you so much, Natalie. This was great information, and I love the idea of of um, using some of the web pages you mentioned that are um, helpful. The one that ALA has about the value of your library. I had heard of it before, but I hadn't really looked at how it operated. So. Wendy says, great info. I will use many of these ideas. So thanks, Wendy. Thanks. And Natalie, um, you said today's your last day at the library. So today if, is my last day. Yes. If people have questions for you, is there a way we could get in touch with you? Or maybe you could I send think. us some. Let me see here. I know Krista has my oh, escape. Oh. There we go. Um, I know Krista has my email address, but did okay. I, think right here? I did not. Um, I will give me a second because I think I sent you guys a link to this. So okay. if anybody has any um, questions, feel free to email me. Um, that's my personal email. You can email anytime. I will definitely find it eventually. Sorry, I'm in the process of switching jobs, like I said. Today is my last day at River Valley, and on Monday, I start up at North Riverside Public Library District. So, Wow. Well, All best wishes for you in, in, your, in your new endeavor, and sounds like things are going great. Oh, Beth says best, best wishes for your future. And Thank you very much. And thank you for spending the time putting this together. This was terrific information. And you get a star because you took exactly an hour. How'd you do that? I am, uh, well, I've got my phone right here that I kept staring at for the time. <laughs> <laughs> I may have cheated. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um, we invite everyone to come back next week when we'll have another program, which if I just looked on our web page here a minute, I can tell you what that is. Um, Encompass Live is um, more than a library, a positive change agent. So that's something to think about for next week. And Susan McClellan from Pennsylvania will be presenting that for us. So sometimes we have local people and sometimes we have people from other states and it's terrific. So thank you again, and I'm going to stop recording now, and 